Yeah, Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Rory and Salome from the Relationship Hello. Building Team. And we also have uh, Christopher Fram from Phoenix Coffee today. Hi. So everyone, welcome to this webinar. Today we will be focused on the variables that affect green coffee chef life. And this, as you know, is a very important topic. Understanding this will help you uh, produce and purchase better coffee. So there are several factors that influence uh, the shelf life of coffee in, it's not only at origin, but also at destination. Um, and identifying which affect this is essential to preserve the coffee and decide how and when to use it. Assuring that origin, uh, assuring that uh, the coffee is going to last starts at origin, as I mentioned before. Um, and it requires a good structure and understanding on why are we doing certain things. And uh, today we will talk about different factors that influence shelf life, uh, including moisture, water activity, uh, density, the rate of drying, different drying techniques, storaging, and so on and so forth, basically. So let's uh, say hi to Christopher, our guest. Today, hello, Christopher. How are you? Oh, I'm I'm doing just fine. Thanks, thanks for having me on. Yeah, my my name um, is uh, Christopher. I'm from Phoenix Coffee in Cleveland, Ohio. We are a, a roaster uh, retailer with five shops around the Cleveland area. Founded 30 years ago, um, you know, and we're like everybody else. We're we're in the midst of a global pandemic, so uh, just just hanging in there. Yeah, like everyone. So why don't you tell us a little bit of what you do at Phoenix Coffee and why are you coming to talk about Green Coffee Chef Lab? Sure. So my, my official role uh, at, at Phoenix is as the coffee buyer. So uh, in, in, in normal times, I would be traveling and uh, making relationships with producers, purchasing and evaluating coffee and trying to figure out how to get it here. And then when we get, get it here, figure out how to roast it. Um, so shelf life obviously has a big implication and in that whole experience of being a coffee buyer. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll explore some of that in a minute, but uh, a, lot, a lot of my interest in this came from uh, the travel that I had done and companies that I've worked for in, in other cities and some of, some of the challenges that I faced as a coffee buyer, uh, particularly when I was a little bit younger. So. Yeah, cool. Let's go with it. Cool. Rory, we have some announcements for you guys. Yeah, we do. Thanks, Salome. Um, so, yeah, just a bit of housekeeping, guys. We will be answering questions at the end, but feel free to send all your questions through whenever they come to your mind. Don't worry about, you know, trying to remember them. Just send them through straight away. You can do that on the Q&A function, which is part of uh, Zoom. Or if you're having issues using that, you can also send it through as, uh, as part of the chat, but we recommend using the Q&A function. Um, in this kind of presentation that we're about to see, um, there's going to be a few questions. So we're going to send through a few survey like questions. Uh, the idea of this is that it's a bit of fun. It's not meant to be intimidating or anything like that. So feel free just to answer. And if you don't know the answer, just, you know, give it your best shot. Um, and yeah, that, that's just kind of a way to kind of make everyone feel, feel part of the, the presentation. So we'll be sending one out now, uh, which is more about just getting to know who you are, who our audience is. Um, uh, Salome is just going to send that one out right now. So if we start by that as like a little tester, um, you guys can answer, answer who you are. So yeah, get ready for that. And here we go. Here it is. Okay, so guys, on your screens, you will see, please uh, choose who you are. Okay, we see this moving a lot. You can see it. I can't see this. <laughs> I can but I'll show you guys, no worries. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is anyone missing voting? Let's wait a little bit more. So, numbers are moving. <laughs> you have exporter twice on here that's going to totally mess with our stats. <laughs> okay. People are still voting, so I'm waiting. All right, five more seconds. Mm, if you haven't voted, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 
so amazing. Let's go. Can you sh see the screen? Yeah, wow. Green coffee buyers and roasters, interesting. Awesome. So we have a lot of a lot of folks who interact directly with green coffee um, on, yeah. the, on the consumption side, which is great. And then, yeah, we do have some consumers. Very cool. Love it. Perfect. All right. So How, are we How are we feeling? Let's start. All right, listos. Let's do it. Um, how do I do this? I'm screen sharing, right? Exactly. Yes. All right. You need to enable that option for me. I think. Yes. Yeah, Salo, I cannot share my screen. It says host disabled attendees screen sharing. So I think. Oh, I'm so sorry. Here we go. Those, give me those permissions. Yeah. Here you go. Permissions. All right. There we go. Cool. You have the permission. Done. All right. Welcome to my screen, everybody. So we're going to be talking about green coffee shelf life today, uh, which is an important topic, uh, particularly in times of pandemic. Um, I started, started organizing my thoughts surrounding this and some of the practices that I put in place uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, just because there was so much supply chain disruption everywhere. And I was finding that coffees that I expected to last just a few weeks or maybe a month or two uh, suddenly were lasting two or three times longer. Um, I was fortunately in a good position because I had put a lot of these practices in place already, but I look around in the industry and see a lot of stress points. And so hopefully some of this knowledge that I can pass on to you today uh, will help you and uh, protect, protect your coffee program going forward. So as I said, my name is Christopher. I'm with Phoenix Coffee in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we, are, we are a roaster. I've been around for a minute. I've been in the coffee industry for 10 years. I've been a buyer for eight. Um, and uh, yeah, without further ado. Okay. So just start with a blanket statement here. The industry values freshness. That's something you see a lot of roasters will market the, the seasonality of the coffee. They'll talk about fresh crop. They, they have a lot of words that they use to kind of apply this subtext of freshness equals quality as a heuristic. And in fact, the new revision of the, or a proposed revision of the SCA green grading sheet has a, an attribute score for freshness on it. So clearly this is something that we care a lot about as an industry. So the problem that I have with that is that you can't really taste freshness. You can only taste flavors associated with age. I don't care if a coffee is a year old, as long as it doesn't taste like paper or wet cardboard, if it still has punchy acidity, it's still got a, a nice structure, a vibrant, uh, and, uh, vibrant in the cup and a strong fragrance or aroma, I'm good. So the, the, the problem is coffee that tastes fresh doesn't have flavors or qualities we associate with age rather than, uh, you know, when a coffee is actually old. So it's, it's the inverse. We're not looking for when a coffee is fresh. We're looking for when a coffee doesn't taste fresh. Therefore, coffee with a longer shelf life, it tastes fresh longer. That's what we're talking about today. And the enemy of shelf life in coffee is this term known as fade. And we're going to have a, have a survey question coming up here uh, in the next slide asking you, what is the, uh, the what, what are the causes of fade in coffee? Fade is those, those things that we associate with, with flavor degradation. So like I said, you might experience that a coffee over time loses some of its sweetness or its acid character or, or if it, it's more uh, distinctive attributes. It might become a little bit woody or papery in the cup or have a, have a drier finish. And all of that is captured by this, this, this concept of fade. And we're dealing with a physical living structure here. It's a seed of a plant that continues to, to respire and have metabolic activity. And so we're talking about a physical living organism that is a, a material made of different molecules and chemicals and substances. So we just have, have a little survey here asking uh, what, what some of those causes might be. Um, and I can, I can move on whenever here, once we have a, a good yeah. aggregate of responses, which I can't let's see. Just, so you'll yeah. have to tell me, Sala. Let's just, let's just wait for now. <laughs> let's wait a little bit more. People is answering a lot. So let's give it some five seconds more. Yeah. And I'll share with you guys. It's really nice to have 
it's Howard. <laughs> okay. <to> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so five, four, three, two, one, done. Cool. Can you guys see the screen? So we Are got uh, 80 percent of, of of responses include lipid oxidation and degradation, which is that's great. That is, uh, you know, one of the primary causes of fate. But really, these are the main question. I can hear you freeze out. See, okay, cool. Thank you very much. Um, so all of all of those things can be kind of. Captured into a few different categories by the cost of But uh, my microbiome uh, my internet connection is the same. So, uh, Chris, wait a second, please. Uh, we're losing you. Thanks, guys. Uh, Thanks, we'll guys. No. We do that part again. So, we lost you for a little bit. Um, after the uh, releasing the results from the voting, can you start over? Um, no worries, guys. We will repeat that part. Okay. Maybe Christopher, you could just speak for one second and see if if the connection is yeah. improved. Am I here? I think it's a bit better now. Yes. Doing? Yeah. All right. Yeah, much cool. better. better. So. So it was a trick question, that poll. All of those things are causes of fade, but they, they fall into a few discrete categories and some of them interact with each other. For example, ascorbic acid, vitamin C, which is essential for regulating photosynthesis and other things in the cell, it actually is an antioxidant as well. So it can prevent oxidation, whether it's lipid oxidation or enzymatic oxidation or other things. Um, enzymatic activity is uh, something that occurs in all living, living creatures, all sorts of chemical reactions, non-enzymatic browning. We're familiar with it in a roasting context. It also occurs in an otherwise inert seed. Uh, hydrolytic re reactions, anytime you have available water, which we do. We, even if we have a water activity of, let's say, 0.5, uh, we might only have maybe 20 to 30 percent of that that's actually well bound, the rest of it is somewhat loosely bound, so it's available for these other reactions. And microbial activity, whether it's uh, microbes that came with the green and or, or microbes that were introduced onto the green and continue to grow because the conditions are favorable for microbes, uh, those microbes can eat whatever nutrition or nutrient it needs, whether it's sugar or something else, and, and degrade uh, the quality of the coffee over time and produce byproducts, some of which are unfavorable for quality. Uh, so all of those things cause it. But uh, if, you, if you take a step back and look at it, you're like, okay, microbes, oxidation, hydraulic, all that stuff. You really have a couple different levers you can pull here. Um, and really, preventing exposure is about managing the risk of creating favorable conditions for this type of activity. So we need to avoid exposure to heat, moisture, oxygen, and contamination and start with more and better material. Because if you're starting with 100 widgets and you can only pull one at a time, it's gonna take longer for that 100 to break down than if you started with 40, for example. Uh, so we're, we're gonna be kind of diving into this a little bit. Um, perch shelf life and protect shelf life. So perch shelf life, heat, moisture, oxygen, contamination. So heat, for example, can, can occur, yeah, we'll get there. Uh, Heat, moisture, oxygen, contamination. Protect shelf life is climate control, well-dried coffee, a closed environment, a clean environment, and density. So while producers have a lot of influence on the shelf life of coffee, that's, that's true and that can't be overstated. Processors, millers, transporters, and warehouses impact shelf life as well, and so do roasters. Uh, so if you, if you look at this list, for example, heat, Sure, you've got, you're, you're picking cherry and you transport it to, to your beneficio and you're, and, you're, and you're processing it. And certainly the fermentation produces heat and you need to manage the heat during the fermentation, manage the heat during the drying. And then it goes to the dry mill. Well, a dry miller might decide that they're gonna store their parchment in the sun because they just don't have room in the warehouse and then it's baking and it's 40 degrees Celsius. And so suddenly the coffee's degrading and then they, 
they decide that they want to remove the silver skin so that it's a more uniform polished look on the coffee, you're generating surface heat on that seed. And then they might move it into a shipping container, which is, uh, you know, maybe it's not placed well in the ship or it's not stacked properly. So there's a lot of air between the bags. And so it's generating more heat as you get the fluctuations during the day and night cycles during transit. And then it goes to a roaster and the roaster decides that, hey, it's summertime in Cleveland, even though it's 90 degrees outside, I'm not going to use air conditioning. And, uh, you know, that's not good for people either, but uh, it's also very not good for coffee. Uh, coffee, uh, in general, uh, the, the rules of material science apply here. So if, if you have an increase in, of uh, 10 degrees Celsius, we expect to see the rate of reactions double uh, for every 10 degree increase. And so and the inverse is also true. The cooler you go, the slower the reactions are. Um, someday I'm sure someone will figure out how to or the, the, the actual shelf life of coffee, if you keep it in the freezer, like, uh, you know, there, there's some roasters do. Um, but anyway, so heat, moisture, oxygen, contamination hurts shelf life. So we're gonna do everything we can to avoid those. But as a coffee buyer, what, what happens if you just get a sample? Like, uh, you know, you're talking to a producer or an exporter, importer, and you receive a sample and you wanna know, is this coffee going to hold up over time? I, I haven't had any influence in it in the making of this coffee. But I wanna make sure that if I buy a position of this, it's not gonna fade before I need to use it. Or if you know we get another spike of coronavirus cases and economic activity dwindles, I need to be sure that this one month of coffee actually tastes okay for five or six. Uh, so we have another survey question for this one, Salo. Um, yes, we do. And this, this is uh, just going to say, well, what, what how can you assess this and determine if a shelf life or uh, the shelf life of the coffee? Here we go. So we're going to ask the, the opposite here. What can't you use to deduce the, sh the shelf life of the coffee? Actually, that was a very big hint that you said at the start of this uh, webinar. So we we'll see. Except I kind of disagree with this, but we'll get into that later. Okay. <laughs> there, it's, it's subtle. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's wait for everyone to continue voting. So we've got density, water activity, moisture content, cupping, ultraviolet fluorescence, field and post-harvest processing data. Okay, Whoops. it's Sorry. really nice to see everyone voting. This is indeed a tricky question, but we can get into explaining why. Uh, I'm really curious to continue seeing your voting. Okay, let's give it five more. Five, four, two, one. I'm going to finish. And let's see what we have. What do you think, guys? Cupping. Well, that's, that's the answer we were looking for. That's for sure. Mm. Um, we, you know, it's surprising to see that some, some folks suggested density and water activity, but we'll get there. Um, the second response, of course, was field and post-harvest processing data. And that's, that's an interesting one that we can talk about because not all processing data is actually useful for kind of inferring shelf life. Uh, cupping is one of those things that I think it can be useful, but you have to know what you're looking for. Um, and, and you and, have to have a lot of experience. This, yes. is, this is why it's very tricky, because yes, you can use copying to deduce this information, but you have to have a lot, lot of experience with coffee and how coffee ages and how it tastes when it's not something uh, with metrics. It is just your perception on a coffee. Yeah, it's, it's a pattern recognition thing. So it's kind of a fuzzy yeah. logic and you, yeah. It, that's, that's one thing I want to say to roasters and green buyers out there. If you're not periodically cupping the green that's sitting in your warehouse, um, that's a really good exercise to do just so you can understand what happens as a coffee changes over time. Um, whether it's, you know, it doesn't have to be every week. Like you're not going to notice it in that discrete thing, but cup a sample, uh, throw 500 grams in a freezer um, and then, maybe one month, two months, three months, cup it against what's in the freezer because then it'll really help you clearly see uh, how that coffee changes over time. And you'll develop a really 
good sense of when a coffee is starting to age and where it started from and eventually the dots will start to connect. Um, just a, a tedious but worth, worthwhile exercise. All right, cool. So shelf life can be deduced by examining a coffee's density, water activity, moisture content, ultraviolet fluorescence, and field and post-harvest processing data. So pretty much everything on that list except for cupping. Um, so for each sample that you receive, I would take a green grading, the, just your standard SCA protocol. Um, I would also measure the moisture content, water activity, density, and UV analysis. Density is one of those things that a lot of folks don't have access to a density meter. I do not personally own one. I use a bulk fill density method. Um, there are a lot of different tutorials online how to do that. I think Joe Morocco wrote a great one a few years ago, uh, just use, using a graduated cylinder or you know, 100 milliliter, 200 milliliter device. Um, fill it with coffee and same as everything else, take an average of three readings. Um, and over time, you'll start to see a trend. So just to caveat that anything I present in this is related to bulk fill density rather than a, a machine red density. Um, know as much about the coffee's history and processing. One as second. Possible. Yeah, I think we're losing you. One second, because we are voting you again. Let's wait a little bit. Okay, guys, this is a new normal, so let's wait for him to recover his internet connection. You there? I'm, I'm, I'm here, but it's slow. Get a little jittery. Good seeing you again. Wait, how about now? Now is better. Better. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, great. It's actually my very aged computer here. So Don't worry, it's, it's, no it's, problem. It's, it's, it treated me well. Okay, so it's important to know as much about the coffee's biography, really, um, because those choices that were made in the field can impact the shelf life of the coffee for the down the line. So I say, for example, was it selectively picked? Uh, there is evidence showing that the density between uh, unripe cherries mixed with ripe cherries is much lower than the density of coffee that was picked ripe. Um, sure, you can sort out some of that later and in sequence of processing, but if you're starting it from the beginning, chances are that means that other things are being more carefully paid attention to as well. Um, so that's, that's when it can be helpful to understand, did they float it twice? That skims off some of the, the less dense material as well. During drying, was it moved into piles and covered at night at any point? If you know that detail, chances are you know a lot about how that coffee was handled along the way and the type of environment that it experienced. Um, and it also gives you a sense of like, okay, yes, it was when it reached 18% moisture, it was moved into piles every night, moved into bags every night and put inside. It prevents, protects it from dew, it pr protects it from rain and moisture, and it has a chance for the intercellular moisture to homogenize. Great. So those are things that you, you want to know and understand. And so if you have those types of relationships with your, with your brokers or with your producers, if you can get that information, awesome. But um, just understand that this is a little bit of an onerous request a lot of the time. So just be respectful when you're, when you're approaching and navigating that conversation. Um, yeah, this is a conversation that has to, do, um, has to be done properly because you're not just like investigating. I need all the information that is part of uh, how you request this information and if it is in the ability of the person that's providing coffee for you to um, answer those, qu those questions. There are some producers that have the tracking down and some others that don't, some exporters that will present the information and some others that don't. And it's very important for you to know these things when you acquire this knowledge, uh, but it is also very important to know how to ask this kind of thing. Exactly. And it's, I think that's one hidden benefit of relationship-based buying where you buy from the same producers each year, because even if the, these tools and measures aren't in place now, it is something that we can work toward in the future, uh, as well as with subsequent visits to a farm and seeing the processing, you'll understand it a bit better. Um, and so you're not just shooting blind and simply buying the thing that might taste best on the cupping table. Um, yeah. and it gives you a lot more se security, uh, gives the producer a lot more security. It's a good practice. Okay, 
so in general, these are, this is based on my data. I've got um, eight or 900 coffees and, and since I started tracking all of this stuff, um, bulk fill density greater than 0.72 grams per milligram is, is going to, is kind of a tipping point where you, you have enough starting material that it's going to degrade more slowly. Uh, moisture content between 9.5 and 10.5. I, I generally shoot for 10 to 10.5 because um, 9.5 can be a little trickier to roast. But uh, this is below what CQI is training. This is below the ICO standard. So this is an additional re request of a producer. So that's really important to understand. It matters because it impacts the yield of a coffee. If you expect that you're going to need, I don't know, what, what the factor is, but um, these days I have not looked. But if, if you're going to dry more moisture away, then you're going to need more starting material to, to compensate. So effectively, you're buying more work. So you should expect to pay slightly more. Yes. When, um, when you're requesting and doing less uh, moisture, um, you have to take into account that water actually weights. And... <laughs> The lower you go, um, it means that you should, uh, if you're requesting this, you should be paying uh, a bit more for the coffee because it's costing more uh, to the producer. So that's very important to take into account when you're purchasing coffee. Of course, check that the partners uh, and the people you're working with, uh, the producers you're working with, and the partners you're working with are very clear on what are the standards for their moisture, their water activity. That's something that's very important and will give you security as a roaster um, and consistency on the coffee. And it's also about um, speaking to the producer as well, because often this is something which is hard to, you know, understand if, if the coffee is going to weigh less. It's something which you need to explain very clearly to the producer. You're not trying to get a cheaper coffee. You just want a better quality coffee and you can pay a better price as well. So about kind of making sure that that, that flow of information goes all the way back to the producer. Yes. That's super That's important. Very important. And I, I also want to say that this is not something that if, if you're trying to work with a producer for the first year and let's say the, the moisture content comes in at 11%, I'm not going to reject that coffee. Uh, it's, it's something that you want to iteratively move toward in the future and understanding that it's very hard to achieve a precise moisture reading, uh, especially with climate change and everything else that's happening in the world. Uh, so it, it, it impacts my judgment of how long I believe that coffee will taste fresh uh, and therefore how I will utilize the coffee. Uh, and I do strive as these are my targets for purchasing but it's not like a, a very narrow bandwidth of I'm rejecting out everything outside these guidelines. So I, I just want to make that very clear as well. Um, water activity is one of those things that there is a very strong correlation between water activity and moisture content, particularly moisture. if the coffee is dried slowly. So if one hand follows, so should the other. But it can be deceptive if the moisture content uh, was measured using a capacitive moisture reader, which most of them are, because they can lead you astray uh, in the field if the, if the moisture has not had a time to homogenize uh, during the drying process. And so you might get an odd reading where it, the, you, know, you, you receive a coffee, the importer says, oh yeah, I measured it at 10.9% moisture, and you measure the water activity and it's 0.58, for example. Uh, those two things don't correlate. So something is, is a little bit strange there. And then if you took the moisture reading yourself, you'd find it's actually quite a bit higher. Uh, so what, are the, what the food science literature tells us is that particularly for microbial safety, uh, the thing that matters most is measuring the water activity. And there are certain thresholds of water activity below which certain microorganisms cannot continue to metabol uh, maintain their metabolism and, and reproduce. Um, and so measuring both of those things in tandem, moisture content and water activity, is very helpful to preserve the, the, the material that's there from degradation by microbes, uh, as well as from any hydrolytic reactions, because you want that water to be bound in the cellular structure of the coffee as much as possible. Full fluorescence below 1%. We'll talk about UV more in a second, but basically I put coffee under ultraviolet light and count how many things glow. Um, and this is a methodology that lets us kind of see what we otherwise would not be able to see in terms of uh, some, some of the chemical changes 
that and physical changes that happen to a coffee during the, the oxidation reactions and other sorts of breakdown over time. Um, and one thing, another coffee that coffees with the best shelf life will have been separated to maximize density. This can be done wet or dry mill as well as during picking. Um, and they have been handled and stored properly. And that's at every stage along the supply chain, including at your roastery. Yes. Because sometimes we forget uh, and we only focus on how the coffee was stored at the farm, how long did it take to get to the purchasing station, or how was the storage there, how long did it take for the dry meal, and how was exported. But also keep in mind that coffee is still alive when you receive it. So it's very important that you have proper conditions on your um, warehouse or storaging facility to um, assure that the coffee will last longer. That's, that's a really good point, Salo. Um, one, one thing that I mentioned at the start was that coffee is a, a seed of a, a living organism. There's a lot of studies that correlate uh, quality in the cup with viability of the germ, but actually when you dig a little deeper, the, the, the living tissue of the endosperm is, is much more important to quality rather than whether or not you can germinate a seed uh, long term. So when we're talking about setting up these conditions, basically what we're trying to do is protect that tissue um, and keep that tissue alive and filled with nutrient because nutrient is ultimately what we transform in the roaster and extract in the cup. All right. Let's see if I can get this thing to, there we go. All right, UV analysis. This is the cool stuff. Uh, so we're going to use, uh, when we're looking at coffee under ultraviolet light, first of all, wear your PPE, something that we're familiar with, you know, wearing masks now, just like that. We're going to protect our eyes because ultraviolet light can be damaging to your eyes, even if it's more of this long wave ultraviolet light. So we're going to look under ultraviolet A, which is 365 to 390 nanometers specifically uh, for coffee to, to maximize fluorescence. The lamp I'm using is about 370 nanometers and it shows everything very clearly and consistently. Uh, I look at a 100 gram sample, which is not at all a representative sample uh, of a container, for example. But what it does is it gives you a snapshot of that particular, particular coffee uh, in what would be a, a very tight representation of cup uniformity. Um, it, and if you look at 100 gram, it, this is also very tedious work. It takes a while, particularly with some of these coffees that are very glowy. Uh, so it, it saves you time. It gives you a look at it and lets you make a judgment call about what this coffee has experienced and how it's likely to hold up over time. So 100 grams, and we're gonna count and weigh the speckled, dotted, and partially fluorescent seeds, as well as the number of fully fluorescent seeds because they present differently. Um, generally, the relationship is that higher fluorescence equals less stability. And for that, we're particularly concerned about fully fluorescent seeds rather than partially fluorescent. So coffee that fluoresces fully tends to be less dense it tends to have less moisture. It's less likely to be uniform in the cup or in the roaster, and it is prone to faster fade. Uh, and I want to note that the fluorescence of a coffee changes over time. So this is a fun exercise. Again, take a pre-ship sample and do a count, put it in your drawer, come back a month later, put it in your drawer, back a month later, and you're going to see some changes. Some things will increase, but overall, the level of fluorescence should decrease over time. So here's a, a cross section of a fully fluorescent coffee. This is one that I got from an importer and they tried to say that it was, uh, you know, a lot of the fluorescence that you're seeing is the result of, of milling of that sample. And I had a sense that that wasn't true. And so I cut them in half. And what you see here is that uh, the fluorescence is completely uh, penetrating into the center of the seed, which is not something that you would see from dry mill damage. This tends to be expressed when the coffee has undergone some serious stress, uh, and typically that would be from heat. One other thing that is interesting to note is if you look at the, the coffee on the left, you have the outer layer of the seed fluorescing, but the inside is not. And that's another thing that you will very often find. And what that leads us to infer is that any sort of source of fluorescence tends to come from the outside in, in the seed, uh, which means that it's something environmental that is occurring to the seed rather than something that is uh, from inside out. And that helps us to understand that fluorescence in coffee tends to be a product of moisture and or heat. 
So this was this coffee that that we talked about. It was dried on African style raised beds. So a, a lot of newer buyers like to look for coffee that was dried on raised beds as a, a way to kind of connote that it it will have a longer shelf life and is better quality. But it was dried in the full sun, so the temperatures were higher than 30 C. They, and in this case, there were something like 38 C when I when, when I measured it, and that can cause some damage to the coffee. And and the producer stacked the coffee in a thicker layer to try and protect uh, the coffee below, but the coffee on the surface was getting scorched. Um, so all of this to say, just because it's dried on a patio doesn't mean it's bad, or just because it's dried on a raised bed doesn't mean it's good. It's what did it experience vi environmentally? What would the actual temperature of the parchment? Yeah, this is very, very important. Um, you don't have to have a perfect textbook drying space. You need to understand what affects drying and how you should take care of it with what you have. There are simple things that you can do to improve your drying. Um, if we know that moisture and heat are the main factors that affect how the coffee dries properly and can be preserved, then we know that we need to be very careful on those aspects. We will try to decrease uh, the temperature, we will add some shade, we will look for cheaper ways to improve. And not just because the coffee was dried on dry beds, it means that it was dried properly. That's, um, that's a very important aspect and it's an aspect that's part of uh, the education uh, process that we do with producers. It's very, very important that they, un they understand why are they doing it and how they can affect or change or adapt what uh, they have in order to have a better drying, which is a critical stage on this uh, chef life part. Yeah, yeah. So like if I were to come in as a, as a roaster and, and demand or ask for a producer to build raised beds, for example, that, that requires a tremendous amount of space, labor to manage those raised beds, uh, and not to mention the investment in the infrastructure to build them. It might be, there might be a cheaper solution, like using airflow for example so creating some sort of structure that allows the wind to go over the patio and turn them more often or put up some shade netting something very very cheap uh and and simple retrofit that will still protect the coffee um yeah and, and one thing that's really interesting with drying is that the coffee is most vulnerable to inf microbial infection when it first comes out of the tanks or when it first hits the beds uh, yeah. because, because of the high moisture. And so that first stage of drying is, is much more critical to manage from that perspective. Uh, and once we hit, you know, 16 to 20%, we can slow things down. But anyway, um, so what I said was fluorescence in coffee tends to be a product of moisture and or heat. You can actually create fluorescent coffee. So if you find one in your, in your catalog that, that has no fluorescence, either throw it in an oven at like 60 degrees uh, or spray it with water, walk away and come back. So that's what I did here. Uh, so I rehydrated this coffee and it has very high water activity. And so you can see that it's, it's like a disco. It's just like, it's, it's glowing and it's very exciting, um, but uh, it would degrade very rapidly. So oh, I think I'm slowing down here. Okay, we're back. All right, so uh, this, this is just demonstrating the, that if we can produce this condition, that it's likely correlated with the things that we've described. And here's, a, here's an interesting one. So this is a so-called anaerobic fermentation. Um, a lot of them tend to look like this, um, very, very much fluorescent. And if you were to measure, a, a very common method of producing these coffees is to gather your cherry, put them in a bag, and let that bag sort of hang out for a while. Um, if you were to stick a probe thermometer in the center, you, you find that the temperature is as high as 45, 46 degrees, um, which is extremely hot. Uh, it does favor lactobacillus, but it also causes this. Um, and as a result, even though it, it might taste very fruity, when I cup these coffees, I don't tend to taste what other buyers taste. I, I tend to taste paper, um, which might turn into vanilla. Um, I taste cardboard, which might turn into cinnamon. I taste these things, um, and I know that it might pop while it's fresh. So if you buy it for a month, use it in a month, great. Uh, but in three or four months, uh, the, the results start, start waning. Uh, and it also creates a lot of issues for cup uniformity and roast uniformity. So I think these, these coffees tend to be harder to roast well as well. And you also have less material to start with. So 
your extractions are probably gonna be lower too. Just throwing that out there. All right, we got another poll. So I'm gonna transfer, just put up the slide here and so, while well, Salome gets this ready. Yes, I am ready. Okay, let's go. Which coffee is gonna Which have a shortage? Which coffee? <laughs> you, you got it, you do it. Which coffee will have a shorter chef life? The one of the, on the left or the one on the right? This is just like your tried at home application of what we learned so far. <laughs> okay. And if you're curious, this is a, these are both uh, coffees from Brazil, dry processed, grown at about 1100 meters, uh, selectively mechanically harvested uh, and dried in full sun on patios. Okay, we're reaching. Okay, guys, I'm giving you five, four, three, two, one, closing the poll. And let's see. I'm very proud of 90% of you. We're gonna- Very proud, guys. Yeah, yeah. Curious about, curious about the other 10% uh, and why do you think this coffee is going to last, uh, no, it's going to have a shorter shelf life. This is, this is something that uh, the, the concept of, of UV fluorescence was introduced to me maybe three years ago by Tim Hill um, when, when he, he was talking about it. And I think he was working with Caravella at the time uh, about uh, to, br to bring in some coffee for counterculture. And uh, I was pretty skeptical of this association at the start. And so the exercise that I did was to separate out anything that glows, roast it separately and cup it against the cleaned lot or the, the lot where the, the glowers had been removed. Uh, so I cupped against that one as well as the reference, which is just grabbing a sample from the bag. And what the results showed is that the coffees that were glowing tended to be a lot less clean. They had less sweetness. Um, they were, stringent, dry, dirty, just really unpleasant and often had papery tastes that already were associated with age. Um, in, in this case, you might get a little bit of hard cup as well. Um, so it's, it's just one of those things that I, I would encourage you to do, uh, whether or not you subscribe to this or not, just to understand the phenomenon and, and make a choice about it. Uh, and if you go a little bit further and just select out everything that glows and then everything that's speckled and then everything that's clean, you'll find that glow, fully fluorescent and speckled coffees also present differently in the cup. And so you can make choices based on that. Um, I didn't talk anything about the partially speckled coffees today because they don't tend to impact shelf life as much uh, as the, the fully fluorescent coffees, but they are important for other reasons that we can get into at a later time. So what? That's the question. Some questions. So, Buying coffee with a longer shelf life makes you a more agile buyer. It's a tool in your toolkit that can help you make more informed and strategic decisions about the coffee you're buying and how to best utilize it. So this is a laundry list of reasons that's incomplete, but buying coffee with a longer shelf life enables you to buy larger position from fewer producers, which is great because if you have to buy 60 contracts a year, or 20 contracts a year, the 20 contracts is going to be easier to manage. It's going to be easier to find uh, containerization for your, your, you know, for the, the ships or uh, for, the, for the coffee and put them on ships. It's going to be uh, easier to profile because you only have to do 20 instead of 60 and it makes your QC life a lot easier. Uh, it's just it's simpler. It's much more efficient. It also lets you use coffee more flexibly through the calendar year without needing to rely on the constant arrival of new coffee, which this year is, is a, a, a huge benefit because so many uh, ports have been disrupted by COVID. So because I have coffee on hand that I know will last for probably 13 or 14 months without tasting papery, I can effectively place that in my lineup in areas of uncertainty to give me some room and buffer while I wait for the arrival of coffee that might be four, six, eight weeks late. Um, and the coffee that's four, six, eight weeks late, I'm comfortable that it'll still taste good because 
I had examined it at pre-ship and everything uh, to ensure that it had a longer shelf life. So buying coffee with a longer shelf life also lets you be more resilient in the face of supply chain disruption and uncertainty like COVID-19 because coffee that I thought was going to last for three months is gonna, now going to last for nine months, but it's fine because it still tastes good and it still tastes fresh. I get to travel less, which is awesome. Um, you know, you can, buying coffee is a young person's game at some point when you're traveling a lot. Uh, it doesn't let you have a lot of stability. It doesn't let you check in with your, your company and your community. And those things are important. Like I love, I love traveling to see producers and spend time with producers and, and export partners. But uh, ultimately, time away from home is, uh, it's, it, it, it has hidden costs, we'll say. And then it's also expensive. Uh, so tra traveling uh, costs money. Uh, and if you're not spending money on that travel, you can re reinvest that money in your communities or baristas, producer partners, supply chain partners. So it's just a more efficient utilization of resources across the entire supply chain. That's it. That's all I got from the presentation for today. So, uh, wow. yeah. Awesome. Hopefully I well, learned something. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. That's amazing. We have already got quite a few questions, so I think we'll just get straight straight into these. Um, I'm just going to start with a few that were sent in through the web chat, and then we'll jump over to the ones on the Q&A. So let me just bring that up in the chat here. So we've, we've had a few questions about um, the 30 degree kind of limit um, that you were talking about when drying coffee. Um, oh, yeah, and sure. Then some people kind of asked, where, where, where does that number come from? Yeah, so the literature, the, if, you, if you look at the, you know, what Flavia Barem says and like what, what CQI says and a lot of the different organizations that are doing producer training, the recommendation tends to be 40 degrees for parchment and 35 for cherry. But if, if, you, if you give a 30 degree limit, it's much more easy or much easier to create a space conducive to, to that hard limit that allows for a little bit of flex and drift um, because mm -hmm. you're going to have some variance in the, the ambient temperatures, for example. Um, and it also creates a mentality of paying attention uh, and being careful with that limit. So, you know, if, if your coffee is actually 33 degrees at, at full sun, uh, it's not, it's not going to be necessarily as damaging. But if you say, oh, 35 is the upper limit, but it's 36 today, it gets a little iffy. So I, I, I would generally encourage building and buffer. I mean, I do the same thing in my roasting processes. I do every, everything. Mm -hmm. It's just very careful. So that's, that's where that is. Hey. There, thanks, Tim. <laughs> oh, sorry, I flipped it. Yes, thank you, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Um, Elvio was asking, is there any machine that shows me the wear activity? Yes, uh, you can purchase a pocket, which is very, it's the most affordable one. You can use an X-Tech as well, but the more precise and official wear activity meter is a pocket. Yeah, um, my let me let me let me roll over and grab mine. So I use a digital psychrometer, which is very inexpensive, um, relatively speaking, compared to some of the other machines. Which is this? It's about two hundred dollars US, um, which is much cheaper than two thousand. And essentially, you would put the coffee in a small container like a jar with a lid on it, uh, and drill a hole in the lid to put the probe in, and wait till the reading stabilizes, which generally takes about thirty to sixty seconds. Uh, if your coffee has been stored in the same room as the device, uh, so they're around the same temperature. Um, and that will... Egg sticks are really good. Uh, we have, at Caravella, we have compared the results we get from egg sticks and the pocket as we have both. Uh, and it's way easier to have egg sticks. It's very calibrated with the pocket. We have the pocket at our verification office that we have egg sticks uh, all over our purchasing station because uh, moisture and water activity are parameters to buy coffee for us. So it is very affordable, useful, and uh, very consistent with the measures. So we do recommend that one if yeah. you have a, a more tight budget. I mean, gen just understanding equipment in general is, is pretty important to this and being consistent with your own measurements because really, you know, you, you have the recommendations that I gave here, but that's based on my equipment and my lab and my conditions. And some of these things have built-in temperature compensation, for example. So uh, if you're using a capacitive moisture reader, my readings are going to be slightly different than yours. 
but understanding what your limits are and your thresholds is, is important and being consistent over time, making sure your equipment is calibrated and so on. Uh, someone asked about the UV light, which is $30 on Jeff Bezos' website. And uh, it's just like this. It's in your pocket. You can travel with it. You can use it to spot scorpions in your bed, whatever. Um, but make this right, one, yeah, it's, uh, don't, it, says, it says right on it, don't shine in eyes. That's good advice. Um, it's called the PDAR2 because you can also use it to spot urine for detecting rodents, cats, whatever. So anyway, so that's, that's that one. So we've got another question here talking about um, like what is well dried coffee and there's another one which kind of like links into this talking about uh, airflow on raised beds. So we did mention this after, I mean, after this question was written, we did talk about this a little bit. Um, but yeah, in terms of like well dried coffee, uh, I can talk a bit about maybe what we look at, look for in Caravella and then maybe, yeah. you know, you, you can also talk a bit about um, what you think. For, so like for us, like we really like recommend that producers dry their coffee very slowly. Um, and they move it around a lot. So the reason we do this is because uh, we, we don't want coffee that sits in the sun for a long time and dries very, very quickly. Um, and we'd rather that it's dried in the shade and it's yeah, constant, constantly moving. And if we recommend that they do this in a slow way, it normally gets this result. So that's very important for us. We also need there to be certain like parameters. So for us, it's kind of between 10 and 11 um, humidity and between 0.5 and 0.6 uh, water activity. So for us, that's like a acceptable um, kind of ranges. Um, so yeah, that's kind of from, from, from our side, Chris, so I don't know if you have anything else you want to, to no, add. No, that's great. To, that's great. Okay. Also, and to answer the question about airflow, yes, that will obviously have an impact as Salome was mentioning before. Um, yeah, there, there's, a, to take. there's an interesting study that's trying to optimize like temperature versus airflow because there is an interplay there, just like in roasting. Um, but, uh, dry, uh, having too much airflow can too quickly dry the outside of the coffee and cause other damage. Mm -hmm. And so you want to basically you're stacking structures, the cellular structure of the coffee and, and moisture is migrating throughout and moving from areas of higher concentration to less concentration within the same seed. And so you need to be very delicate about that process. Um, and so using more airflow, but keeping the heat low enough. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I'm not, okay. I'm not I, have... it, I just like it cause it's like slow roasting. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's very, very important. Uh, and it's very important to understand how uh, is this airflow affecting the seed? Because uh, as you already explained, it will um, dry on the outside or in different layers of the bean. And what we want is something very uh, consistent throughout the different layers of the bean and something delicate as well. I have a really cool question. So, um, do you think People playing with fermentation can make the coffee last less? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, and that's a, that's a very broad question, right? Like, are we playing yeah. with fermentation can mean a dry fermentation versus putting the coffee in water to ferment it. And generally speaking, coffee that has homogenized moisture to start is going to dry more uniformly, which is going to impact the shelf life. So that's one area. Uh, and also creating more material in the seed is, is going to be helpful in, in terms of longer shelf life. So coffee that was fermented versus mechanically demucilaged, you might have created bigger molecules that are more stable. Um, and uh, Lucia says yes. So th there you go. Uh, I, I have a blog post talking about uh, a, a sort of like napkin science I did here, uh, which is basically I swabbed the outside of coffee and then cultured it to see what I could grow from the outside of that coffee. And it was coffee that shouldn't have been stable. It was like 0.58 water activity and 12.3% moisture just should, should degrade pretty rapidly. And what I found was coffee that had been inoculated with a selected yeast had a very small culture. It looked like only a single species uh, growing on that plate versus the other one, which was lots of different fun colors. And uh, what that leads us to believe is that uh, microbial activity, uh, the way that you interact with that in the cherry and after pulping does impact what population is there afterward and thus the shelf life. Okay. That was long-winded and confusing, I'm sorry. But also fermentation generates heat. So we have that, that phenomenon as well. <laughs> like I'm just gonna keep spinning here. 
Awesome. We've got, a, we've got a question here, um, and a few people have asked this as well. Uh, some in the chat is mentioning, we, we mentioned that you can't like, taste necessarily taste freshness, um, but then a lot of people are saying when you, when you have a very fresh coffee, you can't taste it. Um, so maybe you would just like to comment a little bit on... on yeah, the, I knew that caveat was coming. Things. That's, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the thing, right? Um, and, and there's a, a common un understanding that you have to have like a, a reposo for... for fresh coffee and like let it sit and basically what's happening is the, mm. the moisture has, is homogenizing but you i mean if you if you wanted to you could control the drying in such a way that you don't have that, you don't need to do that. Um, so typically what happens with coffee that's super fresh is that it's just a homogenization period uh that's occurring so yeah uh question do producers use uv light to analyze the coffee right at a farm or this is only interesting for buyers now? That's a great question. Uh, so it depends. Producers who are also exporters, I am, I'm starting to notice them using it uh, because a lot of the UV issues can be cleaned up along the way. So as a producer, if you're looking at your own coffee and trying to understand what changes can I make, uh, using UV as a tool is super helpful, but it's not gonna be revealed until the dry mill. Um, and the dry mill can also sort out some of these things. So it, it can be helpful to mill some of your own coffee uh, and, and see what is there so you can connect it to processing. Um, and then also understand what it tastes like when you remove those defects, if you can remove them in the dry mill and, and improve your, your shelf life, cup square, all that. Yeah, that awesome. pretty much sums it all. If you're able to do it, uh, do it. It's a good guideline for you. You will have to dry mill the coffee. Uh, so if you don't have that infrastructure at the farm, it's going to be quite tricky. Uh, it's usually done at the dry meal and at um, destination. Uh, and it will be feedback going back to you. But if you are able and you can do it at your farm, do it. It's a really good measurement for you to have and um, to evaluate your coffee throughout uh, the years and also throughout the experiments and the improvements you're doing at the farm. Okay, let's continue. So we've got another question here, um, and this was sent in right at the beginning. So we did kind of touch on this as, as well in the, um, in the presentation, but it always gives us to kind of clarify things for a second time. The question is, besides UV light, what other low cost methods, tools, equipment can be used for monitoring green bean quality and consistency? Well, uh, cupping, I think, is, is number one. Um, and, and again, just to, um, cupping over time and, and, and developing your own understanding of how a coffee will change and how it presents. Uh, so I'm going to say something that I hope that I hope that you agree with, uh, which is that when you taste a coffee uh, to make a purchasing decision, you can identify coffees that are likely to hold up over time uh, based on kind of the structure uh, of the cup, particularly as it cools. Um, and so that's one like broad generalization that I've developed um, in, in terms of synthesizing all this work. Um, and so that evolved because I was collecting data uh, from UV, from moisture and density and all oh, that. Density is very cheap as well. Just get a graduated cylinder. It could be plastic. That's $10 or something. Um, that's another very helpful one. And that connects to agronomy. It also connects to farm, pra uh, farm practices and all that. Um, we, uh, I have a producer who I work with in, for four years and she just started doing some intense soil work on her farm. She's an all organic farm and was able to increase the density of her coffee from 0.72 to 0.735 uh, grams per milliliter in a single harvest, which is wild. Um, Impressive, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, focusing a lot on farm management practices for producers is very cool and, and, and can be a way to improve the shelf life of your coffee right off the bat. Lots of little things. I imagine if you can, um, you know, take into account lots of lot, lots of readings in various areas, it will help you a lot. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. We have the next question. James is asking, can you kill the seed and stop some of these processes associated with keeping the seed viable, preventing it from producing some of the of flavors associated with fake, like X-ray? 
Oh, I think I understand. Okay, so there have been some experiments like going back 50 or 60, no, wow, it's 2020 now, going back 70 years, uh, talking about uh, sterilizing seeds using ultraviolet light, for example. Um, and, and But what that does is it only deals with the stuff on the outside. Um, and you still have, for example, intra uh, uh, molecular oxygen, which is available for uh, enzymatic oxidation. And you're not going to kill enzymes because enzymes aren't alive. Um, and then you also still have exposure to the environment and you have additional sources of contamination. If you're not stirring your coffee between 55 and 65% relative humidity, you could soak up some of the humidity from the air because coffee is very hydroscopic. There are going to be other things you have to worry about. Uh, we didn't talk about storage at all um, of green coffee. There's a question so, about storage right now. So okay, cool. We can, yeah. we can get onto that now. Yeah, do um, it. So next question is just talking about uh, storage and specifically about um, vacuum packing. Cool. And so Brett's asking, are there any studies or is there any information that you maybe have uh, about if you can increase shelf life uh, if you're using vacuum packing or not? Uh, I assume this is of green coffee because that's what we're talking about. So yes. yeah, yes, there is yeah. there is some study um, and it, it, it will slow certain types of fading. The coffee will still fade. Uh, is basically the, the answer. Um, but you're eliminating a certain amount of environmental oxygen and environmental exposure, which can be helpful. But vacuum in combination with freezer, uh, and you will drastically improve the quality of your, your shelf life. Okay, let's move into the next question. James. Oh, I just I want to add something. Uh, <laughs> just anecdotally, I've done, I've done a study uh, where I basically had coffee that was vacuum sealed and, and stored at room temp versus coffee that was just in uh, the same thickness and type of bag as a, a grain pro bag and just cinched uh, and kept them out. And there was very, very little distinguishable difference between them. So if it's going to be an added cost to get your coffee vacuum sealed, if you're not going to refrigerate it, it tends to not be worthwhile unless it's going to be substantially down the line. Like if you're going to, you know, you want to use this coffee for 18 months instead of just 11 or 12, um, then I might consider that investment. But if it's, you know, anyway. Okay, so you say you can taste the freshness, that at any copying with fresh samples, there is always discussion of the sample tasting too fresh. Is there a better term? For example, open, expressive, vibrant, or reson resonant that should replace fresh? Um, yeah, I think, I think this is one area where I actually like the SCA score sheet if you use it, how, how it's set up, because it asks for intensity. Um, uh, in terms of your aroma, your fragrance, and your flavor. And, and so intensity and vibrancy tends to be how we talk about these things, but that can also be connected with so many other things than freshness. It can, it can have to do with your roast. It can have to do with your extraction of your water. It can have to do just with what is available in, in the seed to begin with because of the processing techniques um, or farm practices. So I don't, I don't know if there's a better term necessarily. I uh, and, and that's generally not even something that I am really have my head wrapped around thinking about right now because I'm only concerned about coffees that don't taste not fresh, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not good. Good at the semantics game. I don't know. Uh, but it can be um, in this uh, term. We you, we often say like. Uh, degasification or too much gas still or things like that because it also has to do a lot with roasting yeah, yeah. okay we've let's got, move on um, to the next one we have quite a few quite, we've got quite a few yeah we've got an interesting question here um and correct me if i'm misinterpreting the question whoever wrote this question because it's uh, anonymous but it's talking about maybe having a better price for specific moisture contents in coffee um and like, do you think it would be fair to have a premium um, for these types, uh, like having a specific water content, uh, moisture content in the coffee? Okay, I think I understand the question. Um, let, I mean, let's just, let's just do a quick calculation here. So, okay, we've got 70 kilos of coffee coming from Colombia. Um, mm -hmm. If it's 12% moisture, then that's 8.4 kilos of water in that bag. Um, if it's 10% moisture, then that's seven kilos of water. So that's a difference of 1.4 kilos of coffee, which mm -hmm. is probably, let's say 1.4 kilos. So in cherry, that's like seven and a half kilos of cherry. 
Um, so there's a lot of difference uh, in, in terms of your starting material and the work it takes to transform that cherry into the final product. And it also mm. will reduce the total yields in terms of exportable sacks of coffee for that producer. Um, because basically they lost 1.4 kilos per bag because of this drying requirement. And so I think as a result, we should pay that difference. Um, I don't think it's a premium. I think it's just built into the price. Mm -hmm. Okay, then Lauren is asking, what tools are you using to measure the variables? Are there any recommended tools? Um, in terms of equipment, is that what we think? Yes. Yeah, so I use the, I use the X-Tech uh, digital psychrometer for water activity. I have a, a handheld uh, moisture reader. Um, I have a digital scale that I use. Um, we talked about the UV light talked about the graduated cylinder. Um, and then other than that, I, you know, sample roaster and cupping. That's, that's it. Same thing. Same thing that you have at the x -Tech or the Pocket um, x -Tech. Cheaper, easier, in my opinion. Um, and as your um, UV light, it shouldn't be too expensive. Honestly, you shouldn't be spending a lot of money on that because materials are very, very cheap. And then you can have a really nice spreadsheet where you can then filter, calculate, and do analysis of the data that you collect. The most important thing is that you are collecting the data. And according to the data that you're receiving, then you're doing an analysis and evaluating your copies periodically. That's basically it. So we've got another, you know, great interesting question here asking about like, what is the reasonable kind of difference you can expect between appreciation and sample in terms of the moisture content reading and the water activity and the landed coffee? Like, when would you be like, oh, something's not right here? I mean, it varies. It varies pretty wildly depending how long the transit time is, uh, how, how many months it's been since uh, I evaluated it and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's tough for me to say, but if, if it does seem like a different coffee entirely, which happens mm -hmm. sometimes when you're cupping a pre-ship and then you find out later that it got bulked with a larger lot uh, at, the, at the dry mill, for example, uh, then that would be a giveaway. Or if, you, if you're uh, cupping it and it tastes noticeably different or degraded or lacks uniformity or whatever. But I, I tend to be more of a, 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 a proactive buyer. So I try and steer my conversations about what coffees I want to buy from the outset towards certain characteristics because I'm booking forward rather than buying spot. Um, and that helps mm -hmm. the producers I'm working with, the export partners I'm working with kind of steer the conversation as needed so that we can ensure everything is lined up along the way. Okay, hey, next question. Tim is asking, oh, it was fun. Have you seen any studies that particularly show what is fluorescing and what causes the light fluorescence? If so, is it always the same thing or can it vary? Uh, so I've, I've heard of a study that's being conducted. Uh, it's still in progress, but it basically has to do with, with lipid degradation um, and that can have many different causes. Uh, you can you can read my very lengthy blog post about this because there are a lot of different things that can cause fluorescence in coffee. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so we've got a question here, um, uh, which is: Is there a good and in brackets here interpret as reliable but ideally cheap source for calibrate uh, calibration samples for water activity readers, specifically the pocket? Oh, I don't know about pocket. That's a good question. Okay. I do. Is it's very, very easy to calibrate the pocket. It mm -hmm. uh, usually comes with two solutions. Um, eventually, we can share the, the guidelines on how to uh, calibrate it, but it is really, really easy to calibrate. Um, it comes with the solutions. You taste with the solutions, adjust up or down, because it has like this, according to the temperature, it should measure this and it won't take more than 10 minutes. We can share with you the uh, calibration method. And I think you can find it online, but we will look it for you. 
Okay, next one. Kyle, hi Kyle, um, is asking, we have found that ripeness and or fermentation can also affect prevalence of fully fluorescent beans. Has anyone on the panel also experienced this? Natural process is a great example. So I, I shouldn't put a, a picture of natural process because I have a whole bunch. They tend to show a little bit yellow uh, under, under ultraviolet light rather than being uh, completely, you know, your, your normal green coffee color. I think that, you know, I haven't, I haven't done the, the measurements myself to, to know what is causing it, but I haven't noticed that if a coffee is dry processed in cool temperatures that it will have a higher prevalence of ultraviolet, for example. I have not noticed that. Um, I, I just received some arrival samples from Ethiopia. One is dry process, one's wet process from, from the same farm. The wet process glows a ton, the dry process does not. Well, it turns out that the dry process, they paid attention to it, it was kept cool, uh, whereas the, the wet was kept in the sun. And so it, ferment, fermentation activity can, I'm sure, impact it. Um, but I don't know that I'm comfortable associating it with one specific type of, of process or fermentation. Yeah, not yet. Um, so we have a question here, which I'll quickly answer, talking about whether this uh, webinar will be available as a recording. And to answer that question, it will be. Uh, we'll be putting it on our YouTube channel and we'll share it once it is ready. Um, but moving on to the next question, we got a question about temperature and humidity fluctuations. Uh, affecting green coffee storage. So basically what they want to know is like, would it be preferable for a consistent or slightly higher warming space to dry, uh, to store the coffee or one that is cooler, but it does change throughout the day. Maybe at night it's a bit cooler, but it's not as stable. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so anytime you have fluctuation, you're going to have like kind of a breathing effect that's, that's occurring. Uh, I think temperature probably is only mattering insofar as condensation is concerned, as long as you're not getting too hot. I can tell you that I keep my warehouse consistently at 20 degrees Celsius and about 55 to 65% humidity, relative humidity, which is what green coffee wants. Uh, and that also helps with seasonal variation in roasting, which is great because it saves us time and energy and fixing roast curves down the line, um, rather than having to deal with, for example, pulling coffee out of refrigerator or and letting it thaw or deal with the additional energy that you need to put into refrigerating coffee and then heating it from a refrigerated state. I'm also very obsessed with resource consumption. And so it feels, feels like if we can get a coffee stable at room temperature and just leave it alone, that's better. Um, but uh, as far as if it's better to have it stable, I would, I'm inclined to say yes, if you can keep it cooler, like below 22 degrees. Um, if you can't, I don't know, you should do some study. Let me know. Shoot, shoot me an email. All right. Okay. Okay, next question. Um, the question about correlating of moisture and price is great. Building on that, would you imagine correlation between price and UV glowing? How much cheaper should the glowing coffee be? So I don't really feel comfortable using UV glowing as a rejection. Uh, strategy i use it as a feedback strategy particularly when we're talking about partial glowing that's that can be reflective of for example a pulper that needs to be calibrated um, which can affect a producer's profitability because it's going to impact out turns for example um, so i try to manage things along the way uh, so that i'm not rejecting coffee based based on uv if you're receiving spot samples and something is glowing and you know that you're going to need it for a long time i would just simply buy less of it or not buy that coffee um, but if you have pre-contracted and you have a forward contract, hopefully you have set up your systems along the way to, to mitigate your, your risks and the producer's risks. Because yeah. that's, that's, that's got to be something more, that you share in that. Yeah, this is more a feedback strategy and an informed decision for you as a roaster. Um, I don't think that you can like uh, reject coffees just like because. Um, and especially if you have a relationship, this is more about building and teaching and learning together to actually have a very consistent and uh, long shelf life coffee. And using the information you have, use the coffee sooner if you have to. Exactly. Um, no, one question we have here. So it, it's talking about a bit that you mentioned before freezing coffee. Uh, when you take it out of the refrigerator, you need to kind of let it uh, reach uh, 
uh, temperature of the, the outside. To what extent do you have to do this? Uh, when can you start roasting this coffee? Does that ideally have to be totally at there, room temperature? Or can you there's a, kind of a, a movement happening right now where people are roasting from frozen. I don't like how the coffee tastes. Um, that might just be a thing, but you know, I'm pretty sensitive to, to vegetal astringent tastes in coffee. And I, I, t I tend to find that the, the center is a bit underdeveloped typically um, if, if you're roasting from frozen. So it's better to let it thaw somewhat, which can mean anything from you have a staging area where you pull coffee from the freezer and let it hang out in, in your sealed bag still uh, for 12 to 24 hours before roasting it or, you know, a different room or something like that. But it's important that you not let it collect condensation so it should stay in its sealed bag during that thawing process. Yeah. And last question, because uh, we are already passing our time, but we will answer to everyone, no worries. Um, Lisa is asking, do you find there is consensus or shared understanding about shelf life expectations between producers, exporters, and green buyers? If not, how do we cultivate it? Your example about the shelf life of anaerobic processed coffee seems applicable. How do we all, how do we allow producers to experiment and benefit from trends while building a shared understanding of the parameters unique to those coffees? That's a great question and it's a very complicated one. I mean, the number of times that I was so confused when I was cupping coffee as a young buyer and finding that, you know, the importer says this is an 86, but this does not taste like an 86. Uh, and it's because that coffee had faded and degraded over time uh, and they did not recup it. Um, and so the, I always had this kind of like, you know, spidey sense about what that fade was occurring, but didn't really know what it was. And that's something that we still find today where uh, if you cup a coffee and it's at like 12 and a half percent moisture fresh off the bed and it's like so intense and vibrant and delicious and you book that coffee because you're standing at the export table and then it arrives and it's faded. Well, the producer got paid for that coffee tasting great. But the problem is it damages the relationship because you might not buy that coffee again because it doesn't taste how it should when it arrived. So I think that there's a lot of just general industry-wide conversation that needs to happen around this topic, which is why I yeah. got interested in talking about it in the first place because no one really was. Um, and it's something that has been a very helpful tool for me as a buyer and I think can, can protect and preserve the industry as we grow. Yeah, and I, I really, really agree with this. It is very important um, to open up more of this conversation because sadly, all of the trends and the experimentation comes from, from like these ideas that people have or like um, this competition coffee that maybe happened and now everything is spreading around. But if you have the knowledge on how this experiment could affect producers and could increase the risk, you should be sharing that information. It is not right to hold that information and not share it with producers because the risk is increasing for them. And maybe you can say a producer says like, oh, I did this coffee and you can reject it, but that is affecting the producer's pocket. So it's part of our, I'm very serious with this topic. Yeah. That, uh, it's something really close to our experience. And what we do as relationship builders is making sure that if a producer wants to do an experiment, he has a protocol, he has a guidance, and he has certainty. Uh, if a roaster is asking for an experiment, then the roaster should be taking the risk on the experiment because he's asking to uh, the producer to do something different, to um, produce a coffee that will increase their expenses, that uh, potentially increases his risk, that will need more space, that will need more people to actually achieve. So this is something uh, on, you should be very, very careful while talking about experiments, experimentation, innovation. Yes, we are very open and welcome to that. We need to learn a lot, but we need to share responsibly with producers. So if you have this information on your hands, uh, and you're working directly with producers or with exporters, make sure that you're being very straightforward and clear with the producer. And if you're working with an exporter, make sure that the exporter uh, or importer is giving and supporting the producer with all of um, the, how do you say, uh, caution 
for the producer to do this kind of experiment. I, I think that that question touches on some of the more precarious nature of being a coffee buyer and the responsibility we have as, as coffee buyers because, and, and acknowledging that this, is, this, this industry is built on imperialist architecture. And so when a very vocal minority of, of baristas or coffee professionals are appearing at a competition and talking about coffees that were, you know, a 10 kilo lot, for example, that maybe they paid $200 a kilo for, uh, Producers notice that and take that as a cue of what's coming, uh, but it's not reflective of the broader coffee consumers. Uh, and ultimately, who pays the bills are the broader coffee consumers. And so yeah. uh, we, need, we need to bear that in mind as buyers when we're making requests. Even if you want a sprinkle of something strange on top of your normal program, uh, making requests of producers uh, puts them in a very uncomfortable position where you wield a ton more power in the supply chain uh, and have a lot more options. Uh, so I, I just generally would, would caution. Yes, very, very uh, careful about that. So guys, this is it. We will try and continue answering your questions uh, later today, tomorrow, you will receive uh, some other questions. Thank you for joining. Thank you for taking the time. If you have any other questions, please uh, shoot us a message or an email and we will be happy to answer. Thank you, Christopher, for your time. Thank you, Rorik. Uh, and you. have a great day or rest of your day or evening, wherever you are. <laughs> Thanks for uh, joining. Next time we will be talking about transparency and trustability. We will uh, send you guys some information about this. And thank you for joining to this uh, learning pace.